their very wall, <laughs> preaching at Hillside Church of Christ. I think it had been maybe a month or two. And I got up here in this very pulpit on a Sunday morning, just like every other Sunday morning up until that point, and I went through my opening remarks where I talked about how great everybody looked and how happy I was to be here, especially as a new preacher at Hillside. And I launched into a couple more remarks, and then I committed probably the biggest cardinal sin I think I've ever committed up to that point, and probably has committed since, and that's that I pronounced the city of Greenville as Greenville. It was, it was one of those moments where you say it, I was saying, you know, I'm happy to be here in Greenville. And everybody stuck. And I remember everybody looking at me and kind of looking at me out of the side of their eyes. And it was just it was very awkward. You could feel the tension in the room raised from kind of about here all the way up to just catastrophic levels. And especially since I'd only been here a few months, I thought, well, maybe I committed some kind of sin. Maybe I'll revisit. Maybe this isn't the sermon. So the rest of that sermon, I was just kind of in sorts. And I didn't really know it was wrong until I positioned myself by the light switch. And no fewer than five people, as they walked by me, said, you know, the sermon was so-so, but did you notice that it's Green Bull, not Green Bill? And one of those people that said that is back there, sitting in a blue shirt, nodding his head along as I say this. Everybody pointed out to me my egregious error in pronouncing Green Bull as Green Bill. But what it showed everybody, as soon as I got up here, because I'm not from here, what it showed everybody is that I'm not yet familiar with the lingo. Now, I have since learned my lesson that I will never pronounce it Greenville ever again, with the exception of these illustrated purposes. But what it showed you was that I'm not from here. I grew up in West Texas, went to school in East Texas, kind of settled here in the middle, but I wasn't from here. And everybody knew that the second that I said that. And I've noticed that about this town just in general. You can kind of tell who's not from here, people that come in from outside. It's a very kind of distinct mannerism. It's a very kind of distinct way of saying it. But we recognize people that aren't naturally from here. And whenever somebody comes in from the outside, we kind of look at them and we think, okay, what are you all about? What's your background? Where are you from? We kind of look at them. Not that we don't trust them. And I feel bad saying this because Warren Levi just placed membership two weeks ago. Not that we don't trust them. But we can just kind of tell right off the bat who's not from here and who is from here. If you open up to Judges chapter 12, you can see this situation take place on a much bigger and a much more serious scale than just me saying something simple as Greenville. Judges chapters 11 and 12 are two kind of interesting periods in the span of the biblical testimony because you have basically two back-to-back -back wars. And if you know anything about the book of Judges, you know that there's a lot of tension. The time period of the Judges is marked by kind of catastrophe, and then by the judges coming and saving everything. Judges chapter 11 and 12 kind of have the same tension. The children of Israel cry out to God, asking for help, and God answers them. Specifically in Judges chapter 11, he answers them by way of a man named Jephthah. Now Jephthah, we probably understand if we know nothing else, we remember the story about Jephthah vowing to God that he would sacrifice the very next thing that walked through his door. That very next thing happened to be his daughter. We're not going to get into that story right now, but that's Jephthah. That's Judges chapters 11 and 12. And Jephthah was a valiant warrior. He was the son of a prostitute, which makes him not have great standing in the nation of Israel. But he was a valiant warrior. And so the Israelites asked Jephthah to lead them in battle against the Ammonites. And so Jephthah shows up with his, with his army. He asks the entire nation of Israel to stand up. They go out, they fight the Ammonites, and they win. It's a great story. But then you fast forward to chapter 12. And Jephthah is now being taken to task by other members of the Israel, other Israelites, because they think that Jephthah did not invite them to the great clash against the Ammonites. Now, Jephthah had, in my knowledge, he had. They just decided themselves, well, if you're going to go out and follow these people, then we should be a part of it too. They just decided they didn't want to for whatever reason. And so in Judges chapter 12, starting in verse 1, you have this tension now. Now that it's no longer Israel versus the Ammonites, now it's Israel versus Israel. And in Judges chapter 12, starting verse 1, it says, The men of Ephraim were summoned, and they crossed over. This is a little bit of what we just talked about. They crossed to Zephon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the sons of Ammon without calling us to go with you? We will burn your house down on you. That sounds rather extreme. Verse 2, Jephthah said to them, I and my people were at great strife with the sons of Ammon, and when I called you, you did not deliver me from their hand. In other words, I asked you, you just didn't want to show up. Verse 3, when I saw that you would not deliver me, I then took my life in my hands. I crossed over against the sons of Ammon, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why did they come up to me in this day to fight against me? In other words, why is this such a big deal? I asked you to come. You didn't want to come. Why are you making this an issue now? And if it sounds petty, just remember that churches have divided over far less than something like this. Verse 4, then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. And the men of Gilead, that's Jephthah's people, they defeated Ephraim. 
because they said you are fugitives of Ephraim, of Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and in the midst of Manasseh. The Gileadites, verse 5, captured the fords of the Jordan opposite Ephraim, and it happened that when any of the fugitives of Ephraim, this is after the battle, when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say to them, are you an Ephraimite? And if he said no, then they would say to him, say now, Shibboleth. But they said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it correctly. Then they seized him and slew him at the fords of the Jordan. Thus there fell at the time 42,000 of Ephraim. By the way, this is how you know that my dad is Ephraimite, because he could pronounce Shibboleth during the announcements. I have expected Levi to jump all over him, because that's apparently what Levi does when people mispronounce things. But Judges chapter 12, you have this really interesting kind of scenario where the Ephraimites are fugitives of this massive battle. They're trying to cross over the Jordan River, and they set up kind of a gateway. They say, are you of Gileadites? They say, yeah, of course, we're all Gileadites. Everybody's going to say they're Gileadites to avoid the sword. But I put them to the test, and they say, what you need to do is you need to say the word shibboleth. And if you can pronounce shibboleth, then we know that you're a Gileadite. And if you're not a shibboleth, then we know that, or if you can't pronounce shibboleth, then we know you're an enemy. How do they pronounce the right? A lot of people do not. They say shibboleth. And because of that, they end up killing 42,000 people. You did 42,000 fugitives at the Jordan River. Now this sounds extreme, and this sounds like a unique test, but it's worth mentioning that there's several times in human history this exact same thing happened. If you go back to World War II, especially within the Pacific Theater, there were lots of people, and especially if you've done any research on that time period, you know that the Pacific Theater was incredibly brutal. And a lot of it was nighttime assaults, a lot of it was kind of this, this subterfuge where people were creeping in at night, surprising people. And so the Allies developed against the Japanese. They said, if you, can, if you come into our camp, you have to say the word Lollapalooza. And the Japanese could not. They pronounced it something completely different. That's how they identified who was of them and who was of the enemy. And so this idea of a shibboleth is not necessarily unknown or it's not uncommon, but it is unique to Scripture. Because what you have is the nation of Israel setting up a barrier between their own countrymen to say, if you can't pronounce it right, then you are our enemy. And I want to point something out when I talk about this. When we talk about this battle between the Gileadites and the Ephraimites, both of which are sons of Israel, I would make the case to you, on some level, that both of them are wrong. The Ephraimites should have gone the very first time they were called. They should have rallied towards the cause of the Israelites and gone to fight against the Ammonites. They did not. But I will tell you that I believe the Gileadites were wrong in setting up this barrier and slaughtering 42,000 members of their countrymen. Setting up Shibboleth at this point, in my opinion, was not a positive thing for the Gileadites to do. Now, that's not to say that we should never set up Shibboleth. By the way, that will be kind of hard to say for the rest of this lesson. That's not to say that we shouldn't, shouldn't ever set up Shibboleth. That was a hard sentence to say. Look in 1 John chapter 4. There are times where we need to set up, and I use the word barriers. You can use the word test if you would like to. I think there are times where we need to set up Shibboleths. In 1 John chapter 4, you see this, in my opinion, the best example of it. 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so what John describes here in 1 John chapter 4 is setting up a little bit of a test. Test people to see whether they're of God. And specifically within the context of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he's talking about the rampant heresy known as Gnosticism, which has several more branches out of that. But he's saying you need to set up some kind of test to see whether people are truly of God or whether they're not of God. John deals very much in extremes, especially in 1st John. You're either with them or you're not. And so in 1st John chapter 4, verse 2, he kind of describes this test. He says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that doesn't confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard it is coming. And now it is already in the world. In other words, there are a lot of people, especially then and even now, that don't believe that Jesus came in bodily form. What they believe was that he was nothing more than a spirit. Because according to this heretical teaching, the flesh is contaminated. And so God could not have come down among man because the flesh was contaminated. Therefore, what you saw, John, Peter, Paul, the rest of the apostles, well, not Paul. John, Peter, the other apostles that were there at the time of Jesus' ministry, all you saw was a spirit. You didn't really see the flesh. And so what John talks about here in 1 John chapter 4 is set up a shibboleth. Ask people, who do they believe and what do they believe about Christ? Did he come in the flesh? 
They not come in the flesh. That is a test, that is a marker to determine who is from God and who is, as he mentions here, an antichrist. I will flip the script a little bit here and say, well, shibboleths, when it comes to doctrinal purity, are right. And I do believe that we need to set up shibboleths in regard to doctrinal accuracy. And you can stretch that for a bunch of different things, but we need to draw a line between true teaching and false teaching. I believe that. But I think when we set up shibboleths that are made off of the opinions of mankind, and we set up barriers between us, and we divide into little cliques, we divide into little groups, and then we cast judgment on the people based not on truth, but on our opinions or traditions. I think we make a grave misjudgment and error and fall into condemnation, at least a little bit, if you can have a little condemnation towards God. Look at Matthew chapter 15. In Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 1, Jesus talks about one of these occasions. And I love the back and forth between Jesus and the Pharisees. It's always, it's always so interesting to see not only the authority that Jesus possesses, which obviously he's God in the flesh, but just how little he cares for the authority of the Jewish leaders of that day. And in Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 1, it says some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem, and they said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. As if that's the worst thing that could ever happen on the face of the earth. Verse 3, he answered said, He has kind of a better question for them here in verse 3. Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, and then notice how Jesus backs it up. For God said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever I have to, that would help you has been given to God, he's not to honor his father and mother. And thus by saying this, you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. So these people want to come up to Jesus and they want to say, why do your disciples transgress this very specific tradition that has been in place for 150, 200 years? Why do your disciples transgress this tradition which has no basis in Scripture? Why do you do that? That's the worst thing you ever had. And Jesus says, why do you invalidate the commandment of God that came from God himself for the sake of your own tradition? Notice the contrast that Jesus is talking about here. What the elders had done in Matthew chapter 15 is set up a shibboleth. They had set up a tradition, a rule, a marker that describes people that are of God and people that are not of God. And Jesus essentially destroys that right in front of them. As he says then later in verse 8, he says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, teaching in vain, or in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. We need to be very careful about our traditions, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of tradition as anybody else. I'm very routine-oriented. I like knowing what I'm going to do today, what I'm going to do tomorrow. I like traditions. I like having a routine. But when we allow those routines and those traditions to separate brethren and not give us the ability to cast judgment on somebody else, we need to re-examine those traditions. Because God takes fellowship and takes disfellowshipping very, very seriously. You see this attitude prevailing, I think, in the early church. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. One of these shibboleths, one of these things that people had kind of set up between them in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, was to them a very serious discussion regarding the eating of meats. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And this discussion would carry over for a couple chapters after that. 1 Corinthians 8 is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you see kind of a guideline for Paul, how, how Paul deals with this. And it's impossible to discuss how big of an issue this was, or discuss this issue without discussing how big of an issue this was. For the Jews, eating meat sacrificed to idols was the very, was the very core of idolatry. It was tantamount to worship themselves. The Gentiles didn't have a problem with it. The Gentiles eat that, they eat this meat, they whatever they want to. And so in the burgeoning church, we have this Jew and Gentile contrast. The Jews were, or the Jewish Christians were holding fast to a form of identity that they had had for thousands of years. For a thousand years. But the Gentiles did not have. And so it was more of a cultural, traditional thing. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is trying to navigate that tension. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 starting verse 1. Because what you notice in this passage is basically how to deal with this type of tension. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 starting verse 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. I wish some of our brethren around the world would tattoo that verse to their forehead. I wish I would tattoo it to my own forehead sometimes. If anyone supposes, verse 2, that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. 
want you to notice the very first principle that Paul lays out here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Before getting into the right or wrong of eating and meats, which he'll discuss here in a second. Before he even goes into whether or not you can eat meat, whether or not you shouldn't, what he addresses first and foremost is the fact that arrogance towards your brethren, or something like this, is straight up sinful. It is wrong for me to look at somebody else, anybody inside the church, and say to them, I am better than you because of what? I am more holy than you because of blank. Now, we need to help people get in line with God. We need to help get them, correct them back towards the path of God. I would ask people to do that for me when I sin, when I err. But all of us, ladies and gentlemen, are unholy according to the standard of God. And so if we have this attitude towards each other where we say, I'm better than you because of blank, then that's wrong. I want you to look a few chapters further, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this is the great love chapter, but look how he opens it up, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1. He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I have become a noisy gong or a cleaning symbol. Verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy, I know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. Verse 3, he answered up another notch. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. What he says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is, you can be the greatest proclaimer of the gospel. Thousands of people have been saved by your preaching. You can have the gift of prophecy where you can speak the very words of God. You can have the ultimate sacrifice of martyrdom. But if you don't have love for your fellow Christian, that profits you nothing. And you can look at the sacrifice of Jesus as being the archetype for that, because as great as that sacrifice was, it was rooted, as Paul talked about in Romans chapter 5, it was rooted in love, greater love, that no man than this. And that one should lay down their life for their friends. Everything we're doing here, ladies and gentlemen, everything we do in the world as Christians, everything we do in our means to God is rooted in love. That's why. When the Pharisees asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He didn't give them one but two. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so our arrogance that we have sometimes toward our brother because of supposed greatness that I have within myself or that you have within yourself, that is sinful to God and it's damaging in our relationship with God because it relegates people to a second-class status <laughs> that God never authorized. I want you to look in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul talks about some of these people that I'm no doubt he encountered at points in his life. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he warns Timothy specifically to stay away from some of these people because honestly, there are some people, ladies and gentlemen, that just love arguing. There are some people who for them, Christianity is not hope, it's not faith, it's not love, it's not salvation. For them, Christianity is a battle of wits. And if I can win, that makes me more awesome. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting verse 20, it says, Now in a large house there are not only gold, silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, some of honor, some of dishonor. Therefore, verse 21, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. This is building up what he's eventually going to discuss in a few verses. But pay attention to what he's saying now. There are vessels of honor, there are vessels of dishonor. How you build and how you cleanse yourself, that's what defines it. Verse 22, now flee from, birth, from youthful lust, verse 22. Pursue righteousness, pursue faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Refuse, verse 23, foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. Notice how he talks about not only fleeing youthful lust, but also loving your brethren and not arguing about things that don't matter. Verse 24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach patient when wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. He knows what Paul talks about in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He discusses the need to approach one another, the need to correct one another. But did you notice how he talks about it? He talks about his being in gentleness. An attitude of respect and of love. Ultimately, we're going to talk about this here more in a minute. Ultimately, with an eye towards their salvation. That's the attitude, that's the posture that we need to have towards our brethren. And for some reason, some of us sometimes, when we build up our own faith, and we're, we've been a Christian for decades, we think to ourselves, we see somebody 
engaging in some sin that's beneath us. I conquered that 50 years ago. Sometimes I have a posture towards them of arrogance. And when Paul says before he discusses even going into the idea of peace, you need to have the right attitude toward your brethren. We jump back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and he builds on this more to talk about a little bit of a similar concept. In verse 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, Now therefore, notice how he's just now getting to it, after he's nailed down the idea of what the truth is. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 4, notice what he says here. He says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in the heaven or on the earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. One Lord, one Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. You notice what Paul is talking about now. After he's left the discussion about the, the arrogance, or I'm sorry, the posture, the attitude we have to our fellow Christians, now he deals with the actual truth of the matter and what the real fact of the situation is. And what he says in verses 4 through 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is, we know that there is no such thing as an idol. If I look at a piece of wood that's been cut and that's been shaped in some form or fashion, just by looking at it, I can tell that there's no power there. Now, he contrasts that with other people who don't have that knowledge. People who have come from either a Jewish background where they regard idols as being the bane of their exile, the cause of their separation from God, or from Gentiles who have spent most of their life worshiping those idols. What he discusses is the fact that there are some people, verses 4 through 6, that understand that idols are nothing. They've grown and matured to a place where they can conscientiously and objectively say that idol is nothing. But there are a lot of people, Paul mentions, that haven't yet quite gotten to that point. And that's not a slam on their character. That's not a denigration of their study habits. That's just a reality. And what he points out here in verses 4 through 6 is that even when you win an argument with those people, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're right. There was a debate held in Amarillo where I grew up. And I didn't go to the debate. I was, too, I was probably playing Pokemon cards or video games or something like that. I know I was eating Taco Bell. That's a fact. But there was a debate that happened in Emerald when I was growing up, and it was on a very, a very intense and serious issue. It was held on the deity humanity of Christ issue. My parents, I think, know about it or maybe went to it. I can't remember. I was quite hoping. Anyways, there was this debate between the deity humanity of Christ issue, which to me, you don't get much more foundational to the attitude and the doctrine of Christianity than that. But this debate that happened, you have these two people going after it, and all the reports that came out afterwards said that the, the side that was propagating the truth, that Jesus was both God and man in the flesh, did such a horrible job of presenting that information that he actually lost that debate. And even though the guy who was false, the guy who was speaking the not truth, the falsehood, he won that debate, even though he wasn't factually correct, even though he wasn't scripturally correct. And so what I'm saying is, is when we get into these engagements with other people, when we get in conversations with a brother who's erring, or somebody who's struggling with their faith, we can win an argument and still be in the wrong. We can tell them the truth. We can tell them exactly what they need to hear. But that may not make us right. When you look at Jeremiah chapter 10, I want you to look at the factual situation surrounding God. Look at Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. There's a lot of deconstructions of idolatry throughout Scripture, especially the Old Testament. Isaiah goes through it. Jeremiah goes through it. Well, listen to Jeremiah chapter 10 to how simply Jeremiah talks about the nature of idolatry. And this may sound silly to us two, three thousand years later, but for them it was a serious issue. Jeremiah chapter 10, starting in verse 1. He says, Hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, Do not learn the way of the nations. And do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them. For the customs of the people are delusion, because it is wood cut from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. This is how they fashion idols, by the way. Verse 4. They decorate it with silver, with gold. They fasten it with nails. They fasten it with hammers, so that it's not going to totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they can't walk. Do not fear them, for they can do no harm, nor can they do any good. Jeremiah takes this idea of idolatry that was very prevalent in Israel and Judah, that was very prevalent in first century Christianity. He takes this concept of an idol, and he annihilates it. 
Because what he says is, is you, you take this piece of wood, you fashion it, you have to nail it into something so that it doesn't totter. You have to carry it because the idol is so worthless it can't even move from place to place. And yet people, for centuries, had a hard time not bowing down to that. And that seems silly to us. And that seems silly to the stronger brother. That seems silly to look at something like that and think to yourself, this thing has any kind of power. But what Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is, is as silly as that may sound, to them it's a very real issue. And ladies and gentlemen, there are people here, at this congregation and other congregations, that have qualms, that have issues in their life, that have conscientious objections to something, whether it seems insignificant to you or not, that are very real in their mind. And condescension towards them and arrogance towards them is not going to help anything except boost our ego. Just because we win that argument for the moment doesn't mean that we're right. Because ultimately, as Paul points out, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, true growth, growth takes time. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 again. True growth will always take time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 7, he points out very simply that not all men have this knowledge. Not all men have this understanding of idolatry as we do. Now, everyone knows that that was a piece of wood, but not everyone truly grasped that concept, at least in the first century. Not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idols now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food will not commend us to God, or neither the worse if we don't eat, nor the better if we do eat. There's this progression, there's this growth that has to take place over a period of time. You don't just become a Christian and all of a sudden become super knowledgeable and move past everything in your life. That's why when Peter talks about the growth of a Christian in 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, add your faith virtue, your virtue knowledge, your knowledge self-control. He builds on it time after time. And there are Christians who are 20, 30 years deep into this situation that still may have some faults. They still, still may have some conscience objections to something. Growth takes time. The important thing, and I think Paul points this out in later chapters, is to not sit in that. To not dwell on that and say, well, I have a problem with it, so for the next 30 years, everyone has to bow to me. That's not the problem. You have to be trying, you have to be growing, but we have to be lenient and understanding that that type of growth takes time. Look at Luke, the ninth chapter. The more I read Luke chapter 9, the more I read about Jesus' interactions with his apostles. And I don't know if this says something about me or if it says something about them. But the more I read about Jesus' interaction with his apostles, the more I realize just how patient he was with them. And we think about this as being this long run. I think we look back on it 2,000 years later and say, how come you didn't get these concepts? How come this wasn't imprinted in your brain? You should have picked up on this. But when you read passages like Luke chapter 9, you notice just how patient Jesus is with his apostles. Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 43, this is after a great miracle happened. This is after the transfiguration. And so in Luke chapter 9, starting verse 43, it begins very simply by saying they were all amazed at the greatness of God. But while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. For the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they didn't understand this statement. And it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. That's a long verse that says they didn't really grasp what was going on. They didn't fully understand what Jesus was talking about. And so naturally, verse 46 happens. An argument starting among them as to which of them might be the greatest. Now we look at that and we think, I can't believe how silly a conversation that is. The same arguments happen today. The same arguments happen today where people try to one-up each other. who are trying to say, I'm doing this, look at how great I am. Verse 47, Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child, stood him by his side, and said to them, Whoever receives this child of my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among you all, this is the one who is great. John then answered, verse 49, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him, because he does not fall along with us. Jesus said to him, Don't hinder him, for he was not with you, is for you. Verse 51, When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead of them. They went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements, but they did not receive him, because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. Notice, James and John were the picture. They say, Lord, you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them. There are times where I would imagine a divine face fall needs to take place at the point of Scripture. Because if you can follow this train of thought, what's happening is, after the transfiguration, where James and John were witness to the deity of Christ, not only does an argument arise among them as to which one is better than the others, but then you have people 
offering to destroy the Samaritans, trying to stop the work of other people. We need to stop this stuff that's happening. Never mind the fact that they're in the presence of God himself, or himself. And God is teaching them the true nature of servant. Teaching them the true nature of discipleship. Verse 55, and he turned and rebuked them. And he said, you don't know what kind of spirit you are. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's what we need to focus on. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. But souls are worth more than our petty victories amongst ourselves. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I love how Paul sums up this entire statement. And he would carry this discussion over later. But at least for the purposes of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he finishes this section talking about this very idea. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 9. He says, Take care that this liberty of yours doesn't somehow become a stumbling block of the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge, dining in idols' temple, which there's nothing wrong with that, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened? He thinks sacrifice to idols because he does have a problem with it. But now he thinks it's okay because he saw you do it. Verse 11. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so, verse 12, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, this is Paul's magnum opus of verse, verse Corinthians chapter 8. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. That seems drastic to us. Paul, who probably enjoyed delicacies as much as the next person, and who, having a proper understanding of Old Testament being fulfilled in the lineage of Christ, in the work of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, who understood now, as he says, not only here, but in Timothy, understands that everything is okay, that he can eat whatever he wants. But he's saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, that the most important thing to me is not what I have for lunch, but how much I can help somebody else get to heaven. That should be first and foremost in our brains. All of us have conscientious objections, or we look at other people and we think to themselves, I can't believe that you're still hung up on that. And in the midst of all these little tiny arguments that destroy churches, we sometimes lose that the biggest thing at play here is not a parking spot. It's not the order of services. It's people's souls. That's what we need to remember when we start having these discussions with other people. That's what we need to remember when we have these discussions with our fellow brethren. I think sometimes we get like James and John do. James and John who went to the Samaritan village and they wanted to go in Jerusalem. They saw the, the animosity that the Samaritans had towards Jesus and they cry out, should we call fire from heaven to come down and consume them? And I think that's the way we sometimes look at our brethren. How dare you take my parking spot? How dare Levi correct my spelling and my pronunciation in class? If I could have called down fire from heaven, by the way, I would have done it that moment. <laughs> Although Joe would have probably been burnt by a crystal a long time ago, let's be honest. But we sometimes look at each other like that. And we want to call down fire from heaven and consume them. And in reality, that's not what God wants. And I don't think that's what we really want. In Ezekiel chapter 18, which happens at the end of the exile, the exile is full swing. Ezekiel chapter 18, Paul is, I'm sorry, not Paul, Ezekiel is now discussing the nature of repentance, obedience, turning back towards God. But notice what he talks about here in Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18, starting in verse 30. Speaking for God, he says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct. That's the necessity of obedience. I will judge you according to your conduct. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions, so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. In other words, obey God. Cast away, verse 31, from you all your transgressions which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart, a new spirit. In other words, turn towards God, obey, repent, listen, serve. And then God gets a little personal. Because he says, for why will you die, verses 31, 32, why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. We sometimes examine the Old Testament and think about God being such a mean, cruel, vicious, angry God because he had the audacity to wipe entire civilizations off the map. And then you read passages like Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 31 and 32, and you realize that's not really what God wants. It's what God has to do. That's not what God wants. In 2 Peter chapter 3, when God is discussing, when Peter is discussing the very last day of the day of judgment, and he says, God is not slack concerning his promise. The reason he's waiting is so that all can come to repentance. God wants everybody to say. 
He wants you to be saved. He wants me to be saved. I wish some of our brethren would have the same attitude towards each other. Where we would put sometimes our petty differences aside, things that are made off the backs of traditions and opinions, and start realizing the beauty of what fellowship has to offer us. That's what we need to be doing as Christians. It's easy for us to look at Judges chapter 12 and think to ourselves, well, the Ephraimites were wrong, the Gileadites were wrong. Can't believe the Gileadites had the nerve to put up this shibboleth in between them. To try to create a barrier between brethren, between Israelites. And yet we do the exact same thing. But when we zoom out and we look at the effect that their actions had on the nation of Israel, the fact that 42,000 people died. You can look at the landscape of the churches. You can look at the landscape of relationships. You see very similar collateral damage, sometimes among you and us. Our civil is worth it? Sometimes. Sometimes we need to test the spirit. Sometimes we need to draw dividing lines between what's true and what's not. But sometimes those dividing lines are based on our opinions. And when those shibboleths are based on our opinions, they have the ability, the capacity to destroy relationships, to destroy churches, and destroy fellowship with each other. Of which there's not a more beautiful thing, at least not this one, than the harmony that we enjoy as Christians. If you're here this morning, for some reason you're not a Christian, may I encourage you, may I invite you to enjoy that fellowship. To enjoy what it means to be a child of God. To come into his family that is loving, that is open, that is willing to help you with anything. That wants to take you as you are, but also wants to help you repent and get where God wants you to be. Not in a social and a personal way, but in matters of obedience and salvation. Because there's nothing more important than your soul. We can help you with that. I can help you with that. Once you come.